And I thought, oh, how this is it. I've driven here as your girlfriend and I've left as a doctor, a pharmacist, a nurse, a care, like everything kind of all rolled into one. In this episode of Blood Cancer Heart to Heart, Gail and Kayleigh talk honestly about changing from partner to carer overnight. It's a frank conversation about some difficult thoughts and feelings. If you need to talk to someone about anything raised in the podcast, please call 0808 2080 I'm Gail Lucas. I have two children to my husband, David Lucas. He was diagnosed back in 2021 in February, or t- towards the end of February, beginning of March, with ALCL, that's known as anaplastic large cell lymphoma, which is a, a T cell blood cancer. I'm Kaylee. Um, I'm engaged to Mark, so we've been engaged two years now. We work together as well um, in the local shopping centre. That's kind of how we met and got together. Mark was diagnosed with myeloma in um, October 2020. So just kind of in the middle of the pandemic before kind of second lockdown. He had um, a bad back for a couple of weeks, just woke up with a bad back, carried on as they do, like kind of not going to the doctors. Um, Eventually, he ended up with an emergency um, MRI on a Saturday um, and they called and said, the vertebrae was missing um, and that he needed to kind of go in from there it kind of escalated really quickly so we had a semi-diagnosis on the Tuesday that they thought it might be myeloma but they needed to bone marrow biopsy just to check um, which he had the next day and then it was confirmed on the Friday so that was pretty quick Um, he had six months induction treatment and then had a stem cell transplant in November 21 so he's just kind of like 13 14 months post transplant and he's had um a complete response from that so he's in remission from that and he's now on maintenance so i think we're coming up to t- i think this is 10th cycle that he starts of maintenance tomorrow so touch wood we're in a good st- stable oh. place at the moment <laughs> amazing news um ours was pretty similar within um with how fast it 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 came on so it, our lives literally changed overnight, shall we say. He woke up one morning feeling a little bit unwell, had a very small pea-sized lymph node in the right side of his neck. Didn't think anything of it. He'd recently had tonsillitis. Um, and over the coming week, he began with really high raises of temperature or only on an evening. Um, it's developed night sweats, which were I'm not talking about just a little bit of sweat and they were soaking, soaking the bed. Um, and then literally out of the blue one morning, he woke up and the whole right side of his neck had ballooned, should we say, um, in effect. It was also right in the middle of COVID. So he went to an immediate walk-in centre um, where they put it down immediately to to get out and get tested. You know, um, you could have COVID. Very, very quickly, it was apparent by midnight when we got the results that it wasn't that and he very, very quickly deteriorated within days, many hospital in and out visits until I had a biopsy, very much desperately waiting for the biopsy results because hour by hour we could see he was deteriorating very, very quickly. It's crazy how quickly it goes because I remember like Mark had, looking back now, I know all the symptoms of myeloma. Mark didn't have any of them apart from the bone pain. And um, yeah, when he was sent up for the MRI, um from that from when they kind of seen it on the Monday um a doctor came around and said like they wanted to do full bloods because they could see something wasn't right on the MRI but they weren't really too sure what it was and that there was a vertebrae missing but they didn't know why and kind of from that moment he was on complete bed rest he couldn't move because where his um where his vertebrae was missing the two discs either side had bulged so that's what was it shut off his spinal cord so that's what he kind of lost feeling um, and he ended up being on bed rest for three and a half weeks. He had to have a brace fitted. So he was in a back brace kind of from hip to neck, front and back, like a little tortoise shell. And um, once he had to go to a different hospital for that, once he had that done, he was then allowed out. But kind of when he was told um, in hospital, he had to tell me over the phone. Um, and all along, I was like, oh, you've just slipped a disc. It's nothing this serious yeah. and um even when he got admitted on the Monday I went I still went into work um went and seen his manager and I was like, oh, just, you know Mark's you know in in hospital um seeing something on his MRI but 
I'm sure, you know, it won't be too long. And he was like, well, I'll take him off the rotor for a week and then we'll sort it out. And like that never, <laughs> that kind of never happened. There's no easy way of saying it. It literally changes your life overnight and there's no going back to the way you felt beforehand because everything you perceive and everything you see, you see in a complete different light. Um, I remember walking away and coming home and, I mean, anyone who's else who's had to go through it and explain to your children, um, I'll still, I'll, I think I'll forever hear the screams, you know, um, from, from that evening. Um, I mean, I've, I've got an autistic son, so his take on it, he didn't really understand. However, what he did understand was the changes going forward and not being around and week after week when he was admitted because as you're aware you, you're at high risk once you start yeah. um treatment so he's put on a high high treatment um he was diagnosed on the Thursday and he started on the Monday but with every treatment because it was aggressive form of treatment it it gave him a lot of side effects on so neutropenia sepsis um his own body started attacking itself his organs were shutting down so time after time time he was admitted which was never good for the children to see because it was always the negative side so he'd come home he would look very poorly he would have changed in appearance so he was a big proprietor to, to being admitted he was a, a big strong man you know um very very dark thick hair thick beard and week after week he was coming home and he was he'd lost all of his weight he was just born he couldn't walk he went into a wheelchair he lost all of his hair and for us to see that and for them to sit to, to have that never mind young children is 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 very very difficult mm. it's things like this that you don't really take into consideration when anyone receives the the cancer diagnosis you, you know you you understand they've got that you understand they're going through treatment but it's all the other the other little bits yeah sitting on the phone 24 7 because i could not go in whatsoever I was FaceTiming him and leaving him on FaceTime <laughs> and hearing the bleeps and the foot the, the you know the different checks they were doing through the night and having that 24-7 because you you not you you know you understand how busy you are in the hospitals and you can't get the phone calls, you can't get the full picture. So I was feeling that by having them constantly on the phone and hearing what was going on and hearing what they were saying. You, you get I got some sort of element of control not that you know I wanted to control yeah. the situation but otherwise you feel out of control and I felt when I was out of control you, 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 there's nothing you can do no. you can't look after yourself you can't eat you can't you can't do anything pacing. <laughs> nothing at all nothing at all Mark's da daughter is a lot older than your children but I remember he didn't want to tell her he wanted to tell her himself um when he got out of hospital but at the time we didn't really know when that that was going to be because of having to go to another one for brace and things like that and um she was going to her mum's for the weekend so I said like I think you, we need to tell her now because otherwise if you wait she's going to be at home on her own and and no one needs I had that I was at home on my own when I was told no one needs that so um I spoke to her mum first and just kind of put her in the picture and I was like I don't mind telling her but I need you to be with her um you know, to, to go through that. And, and her, her mum did tell her before and then, and then she spoke to me and like, and then her heart broke and I was like, Oh, I felt like it was, I knew it wasn't my fault, but I felt like I literally shattered her world because she hits his only daughter. Um, and, and they are, they are close. And I felt like I'd like ruined her life, but it's just that those words, isn't it? And it is, it's kind of, where do you, you want to be honest but at the time, I didn't really know much myself anyway. I still had this negative thing in the back of my head. So I tried to be as honest as possible, which we were. And he then FaceTimed her. But I can't, I think we were kind of lucky in that because it was his back. Um, and we didn't tell a handful of people knew for about eight, maybe seven, eight months. Even his dad didn't know um, because because he was in this back brace and that we could get away with, oh, he's hurt his back. And that's why he's not at work because physically and everything else, he, he still looked the same. Um, so we went with that for, for ages because I think when, and even now, if you say, oh, you know, oh, Mark's got cancer or he's had cancer and he's in remission. The first thing people say is, oh, I'm sorry, because they don't know what to say. And I didn't want that conversation over and over and over again. It, 
um, being at work, we work in the same place. So people were asking questions. So for us, it was easy for me to just go, oh, he's hurt his back. And it wasn't that I was ashamed of it because far from it now, I'm so proud of kind of where we both are, where he, what we've done together, what we've done separately. But at the time, I just you just don't want to keep having those conversations over and over again, do you? So that was kind no. of our way of keeping it in a bubble. And then when everybody did know, um, they were shocked. I kind I announced it in a morning meeting at work and and people were like, You've you've worked all this time and he you've been going through all this. I was like, Yeah. Yeah. Just because you have no choice. I found that because of obviously the different situation and it is, it's 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 completely different paths according to what you're diagnosed with, how your body responds yeah. to treatment. Um with with David. Um, I ended up going off him immediately and ended up being off for seven months because when he came home, um, I had to become his full-time carer. Yep. Um, so then obviously everybody, everybody needed to know I couldn't have anyone around at the house um, due to the risks and in, in the current situation we were, were in. I, I weren't going to work. He weren't going to work. Um, and it literally ended up bed bound and wheelchair bound um, within weeks within a few weeks of him coming home um, and then I, I went from being wife to, to literally having to do everything I remember which I mean one thing that I really was grateful for was people would always ask oh what can I do what can I do and it was always like oh you know you you can't think at the time and everyone's like, oh, make sure you look after yourself, make sure you're eating. And I'll be honest, it's your last priority. Yeah. You go on just autopilot, getting, don't you, to just do what you need to do. Getting through. I think I don't think there is a right or wrong way for that. No. You just learn to get through. And I always remember um, there being knocks at the door and there was food deliveries. And although people never said and they didn't do it, it just turned up. And... At that point, it was, I think it was quarter seven one night and my children were there and I still hadn't had the opportunity to feed them. And those deliveries, <laughs> I'll just, never, were just amazing. Yeah. Just, they just give to hand over to the children so they could sit down and have a meal. Not that I'm saying everyone should go out and order food for everybody. Yeah. But I just remember at that point that someone sat so far away and couldn't be near and knew they couldn't help, but just did an order for the, order for the children. And it was a massive 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 help it's just the little um, things isn't it that just yeah, makes it really, really easier is. it's good it is it does make such a difference I remember when I went and picked Mark up like you say things change so quickly when I went to pick him up from hospital and um the nurse brought him down to the e yeah entrance exit and kind of just in a wheelchair with his two bagfuls of medication and I I drove to that hospital and I was like I was absolutely buzzing because I was like I'm gonna get him home things are gonna be I knew he couldn't do much but things were going to be a bit more normal I guess being at home together and um we could barely even get him in the car because he had this brace on he couldn't move so it was up here and it was really and we had to get him in at an angle we had to put the seat right back get him in an angle and I thought oh how this is it I've driven here as your girlfriend and I've left as a doctor a pharmacist a nurse okay like everything kind of all rolled into one and um kind of wedged him in, drove back. And and I don't even think we spoke to each other because I was overwhelmed with everything already. And all I'd done is is pick him up and, and sat him in the car. And um, we got him back and he kind of waddled, shuffled into the kitchen and sat down. And then we realised straight away how difficult things were going to be. He couldn't even sit on the chair properly because he couldn't bend and the brace was so restrictive because the seating was too low. And then I emptied out all his medication and just panicked because I was like, how am I going to, I was like, do you know which ones you're taking? He said, oh no. I was like, great. <laughs> like, how am I going to not overdose you? How much? And he says, oh, don't worry, there's a list. And, and we did have it on a list, but I phoned my mum that night and just, I was like, I'm, what do I do and she was like you don't need to know what you'll do you'll you'll just do it and um the uh the amount of medication and things and then we soon he couldn't get up the stairs so we had to sleep downstairs for for a bit the only time he wasn't allowed his brace on was when um when he was laying flat so we then had to get physio to order so like um, a chair raiser for the toilet another chair for him to sit in because the sofa was too low like like you say you don't you don't expect these 
to have to yeah. have all these kind of extra bits and pieces and and the first night he woke up um in the night and he needed the toilet but of course we had to get this brace on and it took 40 minutes to get this brace on and I thought how in the end we could do it five minutes and but at the beginning I was like where does this bit go where does this fit is it right are you sure you're able to move I don't want to do any damage and that moment kind of everything like I said everything just changes don't you you one day you're this person and the next day you're someone completely different but I don't think you can ever go back to being that person you were before even though now I don't need to look after Mark as well I don't really need to look after him he can do his own medication he's out of his brace he's back at work but I don't think that you can step back because I always feel I need to be his little bubble of I need to protect you and I am more aware of things a lot more aware of things than what he is um, yeah he's quite I careful felt that with it. because I felt like he was completely out of it I felt that I was his only advocate yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I mean I'm not proud of it but I think I literally fought with absolutely every medical profession professional because I literally whenever I could whenever he slept when I should have been sleeping mm. I researched yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. for answers because I needed to know that everything was going to be okay so my way of knowing that things might be okay was researching Mm-hmm. and says researching things that worked because every time he got treatment which was supposed to make him better it was making him worse and by the fifth treatment he was admitted um in what old literally that would be lucky if he made it through the weekend um and and that was because although the chemo had was working to get rid of the cancer it had had that much of an effect on the rest of his body it was shutting down yeah. Yeah. Um, and then he needed emergency operation, which they couldn't do because he was neutropenic and he wouldn't have survived the operation. And you just felt I just felt at the time that all I could do was, you know, like there's got to be something. So I would literally look for things, fight with people, like <laughs> literally there's there has to be answers, look for a way. And I felt that it was I was constantly fighting for his life as such. Yeah. So then when it came, obviously you know, he's doing well now when he, and he made it through the weekend and he spent many weeks in hospital um, and what got him home, it was how do you step back from that? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I've literally been mm-hmm. shouting from the rooftop, doing everything for you, seeing to the children, had our own little bubble, nobody could come near. And how do you switch off mm-hmm. from that? And I remember sitting crying to my friend one night and I think it was two, three o'clock in the morning, I was sitting crying to her and I was going, who am I anymore? Mm. I literally was like, I actually, I've lost myself somewhere along these six, seven months. And I actually don't know who I was, who I am yeah. <laughs> and where I go next. Um, and I think that was, that was a massive eye opener at that point. I think kind of like where we are now, um, like a stem cell transplant is deemed the be all and end all and you've got to get to that point and I think working towards that point um you're working towards that positive you got to, you're going to do your induction treatment you're going to get this this is where you're going to be at the end hopefully um but now we're there and we've done that I almost feel I've been myself kind of been worse after it than before because I think we had so many appointments and everything leading up to it you just you just do day to day don't you when you go and you don't really think about anything else you just wing it and you get there and now because that that's been done it's like right so now what then what Mm -hmm. what do we do and and with the myeloma we know it we know it will come back it's just a case of when whereas I think before when I was waiting for monthly appointments I was like right what are the numbers this time they're going down this is amazing and and now I'm like are they going up how much are they going up and they're not which is which is great and a couple of blood tests um kind of after transplant the numbers were a little bit up and down and then I kept ringing his nurse and I was like is this okay how long does it take to to kind of level out are we has it not worked has it been a waste of time and she was like no no like don't don't worry like just keep doing what you're doing there's nothing and there is nothing that we can do we just have to go on their their advice and I found it a lot harder after because it's almost like you're just in limbo waiting for it to kind of change course and 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 what's going to happen we're really our team are really good and 
and they do check in with me as much as they check even when they have an appointment and me and his consultant joke he had one on Friday and he's like is Kaylee there do I need to give you the numbers and I was like I'm here like I've got my phone give me the numbers whereas Mark's like can I start my next cycle that's amazing thanks very much kind of job done but I need to know the other bits and pieces that's where we're very similar like yeah. the consultant called last week and he was like do I need is, is Gail there to <laughs> know when he knows it and are you okay with this and yeah, I'm like, I've got um, a list <laughs> And it, yeah, yeah, it becomes your, your new normal, doesn't it? It's yeah. just, um, but you see, the one thing I can say is that even with remission, even with when they're doing well, you you never ever return back to the person that you were. And you've just yeah. got to kind of, I, I'm now in a, a much better place where obviously I've moved forward and I'm not the same girl. I, I'll, yeah. hold, I'll hold my hands up and I'm nowhere near the same person that I was. Um, it has completely changed me. For the better, yes, because, you know, things that used to bother us in the past are just, it's just water off a duck's back, yeah. you know? It's just like, really? Things that you just used to get worked up of just doesn't matter. Um, the little things, aren't they? They're irrelevant now. They are irrelevant. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the most important. Um, and one thing that I will say is is that, you know, everybody everybody celebrates when you get to ring the bell. <laughs> you know, everybody celebrates when you finish treatment. Yeah. But it's... It's not, not the end. end. It's definitely not the end. I almost feel like it's just the start of the next, the next bit. And Mark's kind of been um, worse now, I guess. I think mostly is because he he's been back at work, so he's been around a lot more people. Going through like treatment, he didn't have other than his clot. He had no issues, no infections, no hospital admissions, nothing at all, and. Um, he went back to work in April last year and then he got COVID in June, which lasted two weeks. And then he had RSV in September. He had flu in October. He had um, another respiratory infection. Another, Then he had another one just after Christmas and he had a saliva gland that was infected. And it's every time you go into, it's like, oh, here I am. Don't forget, you might be in remission, but I'm still here to uh, annoy you. And kind of remind you that I'm still still around and I think hospital and a and I know they're crazy busy at the moment as well but it's just you just don't want to be you don't want to go in there do you and no I find it really hard being in there when when he was in with flu I think anxiety now is just kind of through the roof is it going to be something else because ultimately he went into hospital with a bad back and came out of cancer I would those two I wouldn't put together so I'm like oh you're going to go in with this it what what are you going to come out with next? And and when he had flu and we were in A&E, I couldn't stay in um, the room with him. I had to keep going out because I was like, I want to be in there because I want to know why you've got a crazy high temperature, why you've got this. But I don't know what, I don't want to know what they're actually going to say. And um, yeah, I was in and out, in and out. And the, the nurse was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm okay. But I just don't want to know what you're going to tell him because I don't think anything can prepare you for anything now can not not that it really can anyway but it's no but anything anything now think you think that it's everything's going to return and yeah. you know it's it's always always every day in the back of your head mm-hmm. um David's been unwell recently and we've been well, we've <laughs> he's been <laughs> you know um a lot of scans he's had hospital visits we went in for one thing for the check for the scan, but it's come back with loads of other things. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's it's constant. And although we, everyone was like, wow, like, yes, we are delighted. You know, he gets to see his children every day. But yeah. all, all I could ever wish for is, you know, one more day, one more day, and every day we're grateful for. But with, when we got remission, it's been every day he's on high amounts of medication he can't physically get out of bed and do his day without this high amount of medication. We used to be an active family. We can't do that anymore um, because he's in so much pain yeah. daily. Um, and that's from, you know, the course of treatment and things is low testosterone levels, which is a, a result sleep apnea stuff and things that's going on and being checked for at the moment because of the radiotherapy. Mm-hmm. It's the constant things that come with the treatment, you know, which we're forever grateful for because mm-hmm. if you told me this in the beginning that you have this, 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 this and this, but not the cancer, I'd be brilliant, swap it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, 
But now it's the obviously moving forward and living daily with the amounts of pain and the constant, if you get a temperature, it's straight in the hospital. And it just escalates <laughs> so quickly, doesn't it? It's like, oh, it really does. it's just a temperature, but we need to, this is this is where we need to be. We've got to go in. And Mark's like, just half an hour more. Let me just, I'm like, we don't have half an hour. Like time is crucial. <laughs> we need to get in. And and I guess I'm more of a panicker now. That's the thing. And even when he wakes up in the night, I don't think I've slept a night properly since. Because every movement and he'll get up and I'm like, are you okay? He's like, I just need the toilet. I'm like, yeah, but are you okay? He's like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> it's, it's like having another child, isn't it? Like you're, you're on high alert all, all the time. It really is. Oh, um wild. I'm not very well what's your temperature <laughs> <laughs> that's how it starts straight away and then it's like have you got do you feel sick have you got anything else any tummy issues he's like no no I probably just slept on that ear that's why my temperature I was like okay but it's just like you say you get I think people and I guess my perception was it as well before I was kind of in this situation people get to remission and you're like that's amazing it's all unicorns and it's all rainbows whereas actually even the maintenance medication now that Mark's on, it's all kind of weighing it up. Do you take it because it hopefully will keep the myeloma at bay for a lot longer? But in the process of doing that, it drops your platelets, it drops your neutrophils, it drops your blood count, it gives you these infections, or it makes you more susceptible to these infections. Like, well, yeah, I don't, we don't obviously we want to keep that away, but then it ruins everything else in the process he's always tired and then sometimes it's like are you tired because you're back at work and you're doing like 12 hours at a time or is it the medication or is it is it just you like you just you just don't you just don't know do you and you'll never know and it's always a is this the right thing to do don't think there is a right answer for the right thing I think we, we constantly I'll, I'll say one thing is when, when you're in this position with someone who's so close and a loved one you're in a position of what is the right thing. And I think at that time, the only right thing to do is to survive, you know, and yeah. and get through the day knowing that you've literally done what you can um, in what feels right at the time. So, Kayleigh, I mean, one of the, the big things was obviously emotions and things and, and how we felt throughout. Did you manage to speak like to anyone in regards to that or? I think kind of in the beginning, say like the first year until we got to transplant, I, again, you're just kind of on autopilot. You do everything you need to do. My manager, both our line managers, to be fair, like work were really good. So I knew that although not everybody knew, I had those few people that I could speak to and, have I'd, when I did go into work on the random day they knew if I was going to go and have a meltdown I would go into another office and and it's good to kind of get it out I don't really think I've ever massively spoken to Mark about it because I have this kind of thing it doesn't really hold me back but I don't want him to feel guilty for me being upset or for me feeling the way that I do and I've well even now I've only just started a few months ago having some counseling because I do find it's hard and like I said before, it's harder now being the other side of transplant than it was before because I think now I've kind of got less to think about. I've actually got more time to think about the negative things or the negative thoughts, I guess, so to speak. Yeah. And um I kept changing everything around to a negative. We'd be out in the garden center at Christmas looking at all the decorations. And I was standing there with like tears in my eyes, thinking, well, there's gonna be a Christmas when he's not gonna be here. And what am I going to do about that? Or let the dog out for the toilet and there's going to be a time where I'm going to come back in the house and and he's not going to be there. And I've never had, I've never really thought about that before. It's only really been kind of like the last six to eight months, really. Um, so I guess I'm I'm lucky that I'm aware that I have thought about that. And, and that's not, I don't want to waste the time that we have got thinking about the negative things. I want to, you know, focus on the here and, and now. So um I checked in with his nurse and, and his physio and that, and I was like, really, is there anyone help me to send me somewhere? Um, so yeah, we've, I've been having some counseling and stuff and it is just getting it off your chest, isn't it? And talking to people. But I find for me, most of it, again, it's like speaking to people like you, when you know, when someone's going through a similar situation, you know that it's okay to feel like that or however you're feeling is okay. But there's others out there that feel like that as well. Um, but 
in, for him, emotion wise, we probably have never really spoken in that way. Because yeah, I don't want him to feel guilty. It's not his. It's not his fault. Nothing's his fault. But I know that he would feel he's like a burden, and he's put all this on me. It could yeah. be anyone. That's the thing. It could be anyone, couldn't it? So yeah. Yeah. How have you kind of found it? Yeah, like I'll be honest, I kind of like really, really kept it shut down. I felt that at the time, um, I had a lot of worries. You know, I was, I was. Like, at the point, you know, when we came out of the hospital, we were given no options and he was staying mm. in. And it, w- it was that night I was sitting thinking, seeing how quickly it deteriorated over days, I was like, if he only has days left, mm. I could lose him soon. What on earth am I going to do? I've got two kids upstairs. Um, How am I going to manage? <laughs> yeah. You know, literally thinking about every little thing how on earth am I going to manage two children on my own in this house and everything work? Like I was thinking about the complete wrong things at the yeah. wrong time, you know, but I was, I was thinking, what on earth am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? Um, and I kind of put a front on, I'll be honest, um, which it wasn't healthy, but it was my way of getting through because I couldn't see, I couldn't let the kids see me getting upset Um, I couldn't let them see me worry because I thought if they see me worry, they're going to know things are serious and they're going to already see things are serious. Um, And it was already a daily challenge. You know, my son, I was trying to drop off at school and the school that I work at, you know, they were amazing, not only like my colleagues, my friends, my family, um, you know, they were having to get him out of the car. They were seeing to him. So that was one less thing to worry about. And it was challenging. He weren't going to school and just cracking on like everything was fine. He was really struggling day in, day out. And then I had my daughter, who I hadn't realised at the time, was hiding hers, her feelings too, to save me from worrying about her. Mm. Um, So she was going off to dancing and luckily she had a dancing school who were supporting her to, to, you know, put put her emotions through dance, to create dances. So that was a support. But what I found was, you know, it's only now when I can speak to like you, Kayleigh, and, and others, from the, the friends and family chats and things with Blood Cancer UK and, and relating myself to, you know, other people's experiences that I can kind of talk my way through it and mm. and accept that what I thought and what I felt was okay because I was almost feeling guilty for thinking I'm accepting that he could die, you, you know, and, it, and I should never accept that and you should never accept that and that's that's what the, the kind of felt the fight I felt that I was having every day don't accept if you don't accept it won't happen if you don't and I felt like I was having these mm. <laughs> arguments with constantly yourself. with myself yeah. don't ever ever find that weakness because if you find that weakness you're accepting that this could happen and it was like those and it was an escape to the bathroom in the bath maybe yeah. you know for, for the hour of the night that I would have my own arguments with my head pull myself together and make more calls and, and carry on with the day. Yeah, it's tough because um, I think it's it's quite a, well, it is like a traumatic thing, I guess, so to speak, to see someone that you, like, have spent your life with, they are your whole life, to have their life changed. When Mark came out of transplant, that was the, when I picked him up then, and I looked at him, and in, first thing that came into my head was, you really look like a cancer patient now like you yeah. do really look poorly and then yeah and we got home and I remember taking a photo to send to everyone to be like oh he's home and again I looked at it and I was like you do you look you look really this is it like you do look really yeah. Ill, Ill now and and it's not yeah it's not a nice well it's not nice for anybody but it's not a nice thing to see someone like that but it definitely is traumatic yeah. it, there's you know there's no there's no other no. words for it is there I think everybody thinks you know that um and it is don't get us wrong that you know the person that's diagnosed with it they're they're the ones that's gone through the trauma they're the ones that's having to face it they're the ones that's and and don't get us wrong you know you, I would never take that away from anybody that's going through the treatment and and seeing what they're having to go through and the the pain that they're in and you know every, everything that comes with it changes Mm. but the trauma for close relatives also that's you know mm. trying to hold it together as well it's it's completely different like it's a different trauma but it's because it's, uh, it you're trying to support them real. as well as look after yourself and family and 
where do you go? Where do you go first? Did you find that you protected others? So when you, you when you updated people, I always found that, you know, I always gave the positive side, even though like it was literally, I was being told you would barely last the weekend and things. I was yeah. always given a more positive side yeah. to a telephone conversation to to relatives and things than the true story. Because um, yeah. I don't think they'd ever realise how bad things would be or... And I know now, it, like, I, and I say to people, oh, Mark's got a temperature, and they're like, oh, it's got a temperature. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't know how bad a temperature can be. And I think even if you even if you were honest, in, because they're not as close to it as what you would be, or they haven't physically seen it, they would never, yeah, they would they would never believe how bad it, it, it can be. So I'm grateful that, you know, we're where we're at. It's just the journey getting there. <laughs> <laughs> looking back if there was anything you could tell yourself <laughs> is there any like advice you give yourself now do you think to when you was first diagnosed don't google anything and luckily I only did minimally and don't compare your story to anyone else's because as much as you hear everybody say everyone is different everyone really is different and and you can compare the, the small things and you know how you know people are going through different journeys but you can relate to to certain points but just because someone's had one line of treatment and that hasn't worked that doesn't mean that that's not going to work work for you like there's there's lots out there that you know are available but also you can rely on people like us other people that are going through it. I think that's where I've I've learned most of what I know and have felt more comfortable with what I know is speaking to people who are going through it themselves. Um, Google can tell you whatever it wants to tell you, but it's not a reliable source. And I know it's really hard when you're up two, three o'clock in the morning to not get on that internet and, and start looking for things, but it won't tell you what you want to know. If you ask someone that's going through it, they'll tell you what is more reliably like that way. Yeah. No, I completely agree. Like one big one was st- statistics. Do not yeah. look up statistics. You know, yeah. like um, whatever you do, just do not look up statistics because it's just not helpful at all. Um, this what we're doing now, um, talking to each other, the forums that mm. that you can get through the group, um, massively. I mean, I didn't know about them immediately, and that's something that I wish I had had in the beginning, where I could go and ask a question where someone could say they would chat to you. Um, I felt that I needed that in the beginning and I didn't have it. Um, Constantly trying to Google information that I just can't get answers to. Um, What will happen if we're like (laughs) just hanging on to an inch of hope um, for hours and hours and hours whilst the forums could give you that answer straight away and these these talks with, with other people similar and everybody's story is so different. I read about people who have had exactly the same diagnosis and continue to work, continue to work, go for treatment. The wives continue to work. The wives don't have to care for them. And it's just completely dependent on how the person reacts, you know, and other underlying factors and and things like that. And, um, yeah, just to – and also I kind of think I I accept what I did. Um, (laughs) Do I agree that everything was correct? No. Would I change anything? Probably not. No, me neither. Me neither. Probably not. Um, because the journey that we've come through has got we so like we always were close, but it's got we so much closer. And I can now feel like I can give and feedback so much that I've taken from it to help mm. others. Yeah. Um definitely. And I think that's like a massive thing. Like I'm I'm the shy person everywhere and everyone's like, you're going out and you're doing these things. And I'm like, yeah, because people have had to do that for me to know or for us to know what we know now and to move forward. Like 100% people deserve that from me to go forward as well. And there's, yeah, I will talk the ear off anyone about it now because every day Mark's like oh you're gonna do this I'm like yes because people need people need to know don't they and it's just mm-hmm. it shouldn't 
shouldn't be like a hidden thing but if that's how someone wants to deal with it that's completely fine like that's however you feel you just need to know that that is okay it's your feelings yeah. whatever are valid to think if you're angry that's fine if you're sad that's fine if you're stuck in your positivity bubble that's fine as well you can't you just have to go you just have to wing it really don't you every day <laughs> just you really it. do <laughs> I found myself one day pacing in the kitchen I think I, I think I paced for two and a half hours you know <laughs> but that's okay because yeah. that got me through two and a half hours <laughs> yeah. and I think it's just accepting that you know that everything and things that you do there's no right or wrong way there's no one path that everybody should follow yeah. um but just be you know um we've just got to be true to ourselves and not over expect as well because I mean I I know you Kerry from what you've you've spoken to me about here and we, we have put far too much pressure on ourselves yeah you we definitely do yeah and you kind of forget look at everything that you've been through from the beginning and and you've done it because you could and if if something happened again you'll deal with it because you can deal with it but at the time you you just think oh my god what am I gonna do but you will you will deal with it in whatever way is right for you 